right, we're in a Upper Newport Bay Ecological Reserve, which is managed by the Department of Fish and Wildlife, California State Agency, the County Parks, um, a local nonprofit called the Newport Bay Conservancy. And what you're seeing out here is actually a uh, estuary that is a, a big meadow of Spartina foliosa, which is a special cord grass that uh, a critically endangered bird, the light-footed Ridgeways rail, um, resides in. So there's less than a thousand birds left in, in the in the world, and um, about half of them live at this thousand-acre um, estuary. And then as you come up um, into the uh, the upland, this is all coastal sage scrub that is more of the dry habitat that you would find in a, in a native ecosystem here, which is home to another endangered bird, the California gnatcatcher. This is a, a big area for community, um, naturalist training. There are a lot of different um, um, groups that do marine wildlife um, tours, um, naturalist tours, habitat restoration, and um, environmental education which allows this community and school groups to really connect with nature. So even though we live in a sea of, of uh, urban space, of, of houses and buildings, this is a respite for that community where they can come and still connect with nature and understand the natural world before it's gone. We're standing under the canopy of a, an invasive grove of Brazilian pepper trees. So like the name says, uh, they, are a, they are from Brazil. Um, they put a, a lelopathic toxin into the soil that doesn't allow anything else to grow but itself. So it's actually removing habitat as an invasive species for other native wildlife and, and plants. So really, really dampening the biodiversity that can occur in this area. So even though it does have a, a nice shade for us to enjoy, um, there's very little diversity um, here. So um, a lot of volunteers in, in, uh, for the nonprofit, the Newport Bay Conservancy, uh, tries to get rid of these trees, but the size of them there, it's very expensive. And, um, and then you have to restore it with all the toxins in there. So, and if you look behind you, they're actually spreading to the other side of the hill. So, or on the, the toe of the slope. And, it, and all that kind of shrubs is really where all the biodiversity is. Uh, over a thousand species of plants that only occur in California and nowhere else in the entire planet. Wow. Yeah. And, and a few. One of 34? One of 34 biodiversity hotspots in the world, yeah. It's actually um, a parasitic plant. Look at it, you can see actually a flower bud on it right there and since it doesn't have any green it doesn't have any chlorophyll it's actually not photosynthesizing it's literally stealing all the sugars and nutrients and water from this um, alkali heath Frankinia salina. so these are two different plants yep and this is a the one is the witch's hair is a parasite yeah and the orange is actually a carotene it's actually flowering right now it has a very little white flowers um, you know, since it's growing in, in basically uh, a highly saline environment, they're called halophytes, meaning salt loving. And they're actually storing the salt in those red tips and the red tips right there, and then those fall off. So that's the way it actually exudes the salt from, from the rest of the plant. So this plant is actually has, there's three species here um, at Upper Newport Bay and uh, they grow in different kind of levels of the of the water and there's an endangered bird called the belling savanna sparrow that solely nests in this pickleweed environment native americans would eat this and it tastes like pickles salty pickles so in an estuary you actually can get a, a high productivity especially in the summer months you have these you have these long long days that are 16 hour days and during that time the wetlands are actually photosynthesizing that amount. And actually the amount of carbon that is sequestering into these, into this system is greater than a tropical rainforest um, that would be in the same time. Now in the winter, there's not enough sunlight, so it's not productive as a tropical rainforest in the winter, but in the summer, it's actually more productive, taking in much more carbon 
and in, as uh, evidence you can see in this mud right here in these footprints the amount of black carbon there that's being stored in that mud the other reason why is the mud is anoxic which means without oxygen so uh, the decomposition rate is 19 times less than if it was actually like a turned compost that's decomposing california horned snails or uh, serifidia so if you actually were to start looking deep into the into this this shoreline and the different uh, invertebrates in here you'll see um you know at low tide there'll be just thousands of, of shorebirds out here and they they eat all of this stuff so you can see like i was mentioning before that the sequestration sequestration of carbon in the salt marsh is, is taking that carbon in then becoming the plants the plants are decomposing which these animals are eating and then they're surviving that way and then you have birds that are migrating from the arctic down here and connecting with this so that it really is showing that all of this is so important in the connection of the planet and how all all living things really are depend on one another so with the loss of, of our wetlands 97 percent of southern california this every square foot of this area is critical in um keeping the balance that we have left for, for wildlife so this cactus right here is called prickly pear cactus um, back when i was in college we planted this um, in 2006 and uh, it just shows how slow this really grows i mean this cactus survived one of the greatest droughts in 1200 years from uh, 2012 to 2016 and uh you know the reason why we planted this was for the uh, Cal california cactus wren the coastal cactus wren which needs at least three foot tall cactus so look how long it's taken one thing that I see, I, we had closed this trail off during the restoration. This was a big white trail. Now you can see it's actually natives have closed, closed in on it. This bug here is called a cochineal bug. Native Americans would actually use this bug as a dye so that they could um, dye their clothes and everything. So actually when colonialists came here, red dye was really a royal color that they couldn't find. And then they saw the tribes people had it everywhere. So they actually brought this back to Europe and used it as a dye. So that's actually a female bug called the cochineal bug that is just attached to the cactus feeding. When you um, kind of smash them, you get this, this, uh, this red dye. This is a habitat restoration site that uh, I was a part of back in 2006 and 2007. We were able to get a 10,000 acre grant from a nonprofit that I ran called the Orange County Chapter of the Society for Conservation Biology when I was a student at UCI. So students have a lot of power if they actually put their community um, engagement in. We had professors out here, we had community members, parents, friends. We planted this and weeded this, and today there now is a pair of, of endangered California gnat catchers that use this. Trails have been closed, and so we've actually increased uh, biodiversity at this site and um, fulfilled the goal and the mission of Upper Newport Bay and conservation so that things can uh, have a lot more space to survive.